Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. Today we will be continuing The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Chapter 10. Dickon. The sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy storybooks, and she had read of secret gardens in some of the stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years, which she had thought must be rather stupid. She had no intention of going to sleep, and in fact she was becoming wider awake every day which passed at Misselthwaite. She was beginning to like to be out of doors. She no longer hated the wind, but enjoyed it. She could run faster and longer, and she could skip up to a hundred. The bulbs in the secret garden must have been much astonished. Such nice clear places were made round them that they had all the breathing space they wanted. And really, if Mistress Mary had known it, they began to cheer up under the dark earth and work tremendously. The sun could get at them and warm them, and when the rain came down it could reach them at once, so they began to feel very much alive. Mary was an odd, determined little person, and now she had something interesting to be determined about. She was very much absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily, only becoming more pleased with her work every hour, instead of tiring of it. It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. She found many more of the sprouting pale green points than she had ever hoped to find. They seemed to be starting up everywhere, and each day she was sure she found tiny new ones, some so tiny that they barely peeped over the earth. There were so many that she remembered what Martha had said about the snowdrops by the thousands, and about bulbs spreading and making new ones. These had been left to themselves for ten years, and perhaps they had spread like snowdrops into thousands. She wondered how long it would be before they showed that they were flowers. Sometimes she stopped digging to look at the garden, and try to imagine what it would be like when it was covered with thousands of lovely things in bloom. During that week of sunshine, she became more intimate with Ben Weatherstaff. She surprised him several times by seeming to start up beside him as if she sprang out of the earth. The truth was that she was afraid that he would pick up his tools and go away if he saw her coming, so she always walked toward him as silently as possible. But, in fact, he did not object to her as strongly as he had at first. Perhaps he was secretly rather flattered by her evident desire for his elderly company. Then also she was much more civil than she had been. He did not know that when f she first saw him, she spoke to him as she would have spoken to a native, and had not known that a cross, sturdy old Yorkshireman was not accustomed to Salem to his masters, and be merely commanded by them to do things. Thou'rt like the robin, he said to her one morning, when he lifted his head and saw her standing by him. I never knows when I shall see thee or which side thou come from. He's friends with me now, said Mary. That's like him, snapped Ben Weatherstaff, making up to the women folk just for vanity and flightiness. There's nothing he wouldn't do for the sake of showing off and flirting his tail feathers. He's as full of pride as an egg's full of meat. He very seldom talked much, and sometimes did not even answer Mary's questions except by a grunt. But this morning he had said more than usual. He stood up and rested one hobnailed boot on the top of his spade while he looked her over. "'How long has the been here?' he jerked out. "'I think it's about a month,' she answered. "'That's beginning to do Misselthwaite credit,' he said. "'That's a bit fatter than thou was, and that's not quite so yeller. "'Thou looked like a young plucked crow when I the first came into the garden. "'Thinks I to myself, I never set eyes on an uglier, sour-faced young un. "'Mary was not vain, and as she had never thought much of her looks, "'she was not greatly disturbed. "'I know I'm fatter,' she said. My stockings are getting tighter. They used to make wrinkles. There's the robin, Ben Weatherstaff. There indeed was the robin, and she thought he looked nicer than ever. His red waistcoat was as glossy as satin, and he flirted his wings and tail and tilted his head and hopped about with all sorts of lively graces. He seemed determined to make Ben Weatherstaff admire him, but Ben was sarcastic. Aye, there thou art, he said. 
That can put up with me for a bit sometimes when there's got no one better. Thus been reddening up thy waistcoat and polishing thy feathers this two weeks. I know what thou's been up to. Thou's courting some bold young madam somewhere, telling thy lies to her about being the finest cock robin on Mistlemore, and ready to fight all the rest of them. Oh, look at him! exclaimed Mary. The robin was evidently in a fascinating, bold mood. He hopped closer and closer and looked at Ben Weatherstaff more and more engagingly. He flew onto the nearest currant bush and tilted his head and sang a little song right at him. "'Thou thinks thou get over me by doing that,' said Ben, wrinkling his face up in such a way that Mary felt sure he was trying not to look pleased. "'Thou thinks no one can stand out against thee. That's what thou thinks.' The robin spread his wings. Mary could scarcely believe her eyes. He flew right up to the handle of Ben Weatherstaff's spade and alighted on the top of it. Then the old man's face wrinkled itself slowly into a new expression. He stood still as if he were afraid to breathe, as if he would not have stirred for the world, lest his robin should start away. He spoke quite in a whisper. "'Well, I'm danged,' he said as softly as if he were saying something quite different. "'That does know how to get out of chap, that does. "'That's fair unearthly, that's a knowin.' And he stood without stirring, almost without drawing his breath, until the robin gave another flirt to his wings and flew away. Then he stood looking at the handle of the spade as if there might be magic in it, and then he began to dig again and said nothing for several minutes. But because he kept breaking into a slow grin now and then, Mary was not afraid to talk to him. "'Have you a garden of your own?' she asked. "'No, I'm a bachelor and lodge with Martin at the gate.' "'If you had one,' said Mary, "'what would you plant?' cabbages and taters and onions. But if you wanted to make a flower garden, persisted Mary, what would you plant? Bulbs and sweet-smelling things, but mostly roses. Mary's face lighted up. Do you like roses? she said. Ben Weatherstaff rooted up a weed and threw it aside before he answered. Well, yes, I do. I was learned by a young lady. I was gardener, too. She had a lot in a place she was fond of, and she loved them like they was children or robins. I've seen her bend over and kiss them. He dragged out another weed and scowled at it. They were as much as ten years ago. Where is she now? asked Mary, much interested. Heaven, he answered, and drove his spade deep into the soil, according to what Parson says. What happened to the roses? Mary asked again, more interested than ever. They was left to themselves. Mary was becoming quite excited. Did they quite die? Do roses quite die when they are left to themselves? She ventured. Well, I'd got to like them, and I liked her, and she liked them, Ben Weatherstaff admitted reluctantly. Once or twice a year I'd go and work at them a bit, prune them and dig about the roots. They run wild, but they was in rich soil, so some of them lived. When they have no leaves and look gray and brown and dry— "'How can you tell whether they are dead or alive?' inquired Mary. "'Wait till the spring gets at em. "'Wait till the sun shines on the rain, "'and the rain falls on the sunshine, "'and then they'll find out.' "'How? "'How?' cried Mary, forgetting to be careful. "'Look along the twigs and branches, "'and if the sea is a bit of a brown lump swelling here and there, "'watch it after the warm rain and see what happens.' "'He stopped suddenly and looked curiously at her eager face.' "'Why does thou care so much about roses and such all of a sudden?' he demanded. Mistress Mary felt her face grow red. She was almost afraid to answer. "'I—I I want to play that—that that I have a garden of my own,' she stammered. "'I—there is nothing for me to do. I have nothing and no one.' "'Well,' said Ben Weatherstaff slowly as he watched her, "'that's true. The hasn't.' He said it in such an odd way that Mary wondered if he was actually a little sorry for her. She had never felt sorry for herself. She had only felt tired and cross because she disliked people and things so much. But now the world seemed to be changing and getting nicer. If no one found out about the secret garden, she should enjoy herself always. She stayed with him for ten or fifteen minutes longer and asked him as many questions as she dared. He answered every one of them in his queer grunting way, and he did not seem really cross and did not pick up his spade and leave her. He said something about roses, just as she was going away, and it reminded her of the ones he had said he had been fond of. "'Do you go and see those other roses now?' she asked. "'Not been this year. My rheumatics has been me too stiff in the joints.' 
he said it in his grumbling voice, and then quite suddenly he seemed to get angry with her, though she did not see why he should. Now look here, he said sharply, don't thou ask so many questions. Thou art the worst wench for asking questions I've ever come across. Get thee gone and play thee. I've done talking for today. And he said it so crossly that she knew there was not the least use in staying another minute. She went skipping slowly down the outside walk, thinking him over and over, and saying to herself that, queer as it was, here was another person whom she liked in spite of his crossness. She liked old Ben Weatherstaff. Yes, she did like him. She always wanted to try to make him talk to her. Also, she began to believe that he knew everything in the world about flowers. There was a laurel-hedged walk which curved round the secret garden and ended at a gate which opened into a wood in the park. She thought she would slip round this walk and look into the wood and see if there were any rabbits hopping about. She enjoyed the skipping very much, and when she reached the little gate, she opened it and went through, because she heard a low, peculiar whistling sound and wanted to find out what it was. It was a very strange thing indeed. She quite caught her breath as she stopped to look at it. A boy was sitting under a tree with his back against it, playing on a rough wooden pipe. He was a funny-looking boy about twelve. He looked very clean, and his nose turned up, and his cheeks were as red as poppies, and never had Mistress Mary seen such round and such blue eyes in any boy's face. And on the trunk of the tree he leaned against, a brown squirrel was clinging and watching him, and from behind a bush nearby a cock pheasant was delicately stretching his neck to peep out, and quite near him were two rabbits sitting up and sniffing with tremulous noses and actually it appeared as if they were all drawing near to watch him and listen to the strange, low little call his pipe seemed to make. When he saw Mary, he held up his hand and spoke to her in a voice almost as low as, and rather like his piping, "'Don't the move,' he said. "'It'll flighten.' Mary remained motionless. He stopped playing his pipe and began to rise from the ground. He moved so slowly that it scarcely seemed as though he were moving at all, but at last he stood on his feet, and then the squirrel scampered back up into the branches of his tree. The pheasant withdrew his head, and the rabbits dropped on all fours and began to hop away, though not at all as if they were frightened. "'I'm Dickon,' the boy said. "'I know thou'rt Miss Mary.' Then Mary realized that somehow she had known at first that he was Dickon. Who else could have been charming rabbits and pheasants as the natives charm snakes in India? He had a wide, red, curving mouth, and his smile spread all over his face. I got up slow, he explained, because if them makes a quick move, it startles em. A body has to move gentle and speak low when wild things is about. He did not speak to her as if they had never seen each other before, but as if he knew her quite well. Mary knew nothing about boys, and she spoke to him a little stiffly because she felt rather shy. Did you get Martha's letter? she asked. He nodded his curly, rust-colored head. That's why I come. He stood to pick up something which had been lying on the ground beside him when he piped. I've got the garden tools. There's a little spade and rake and a fork and a hoe. Eh, they're good uns. There's a trowel, too, and the woman in the shop threw in a packet of white poppy and one of blue larkspur when I bought the other seeds. Will you show the seeds to me? Mary said. She wished she could talk as he did. His speech was so quick and easy. It sounded as if he liked her and was not the least afraid she would not like him, though he was only a common moor boy, in patched clothes and with a funny face and a rough, rusty red head. As she came closer to him, she noticed that there was a clean, fresh scent of heather and grass and leaves about him, almost as if he were made of them. She liked it very much, and when she looked into his funny face with the red cheeks and round blue eyes, she forgot that she had felt shy. "'Let us sit down on this log and look at them,' she said. They sat down, and he took a clumsy little brown paper package out of his coat pocket. He untied the string, and inside there were ever so many neither and smaller packages with a picture of a flower on each one. "'There's a lot of mignette and poppies,' he said. "'Mignette's the sweetest smelling thing as grows, and it'll grow wherever you cast it, same as poppies will. Them as'll come up and bloom if you just whistle to em. Them's the nicest of all.' He stopped and turned his head quickly, his poppy-cheeked face lighting up. "'Where's that robin as is calls us?' he said. The chirp came from a thick holly bush, bright with scarlet berries, and Mary thought she knew whose it was. "'Is it really calling us?' she asked. "'Aye,' said Dickon, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. "'He's calling someone he's friends with. That's the same as saying, "'Here I am. Look at me. I wants a bit of a chat.' 
There he is in the bush. Whose is he? He's been Weatherstaff's, but I think he knows me a little, answered Mary. Aye, he knows thee, said Dickon, in his low voice again, and he likes thee. He's took thee on. He'll tell me all about thee in a minute. He moved quite close to the bush with the slow movement Mary had noticed before, and then he made a sound almost like the robin's own twitter. The robin listened a few seconds intently and then answered quite as if he were replying to a question. Aye, he's a friend of yours, chuckled Dickon. Do you think he is? cried Mary eagerly. She did so want to know. Do you think he really likes me? He wouldn't come near thee if he didn't, answered Dickon. Birds is rare choosers, and a robin can flout a body worse than a man. See, he's making up to thee now. Cannot thus see a chap? He's saying. And it really seemed as if it must be true. He's so sidled and twittered and tilted as he hopped on his bush. Do you understand everything birds say? said Mary. Dickens' grin spread until he seemed all wide, red, curving mouth, and he rubbed his rough head. I think I do, and they think I do, he said. I've lived on the moor with them so long. I've watched them break shell and come out and fledge and learn to fly and begin to sing till I think I'm one of them. Sometimes I think perhaps I'm a bird or a fox or a rabbit or a squirrel or even a beetle, and I don't know it. He laughed and came back to the log and began to talk about the flower seeds again. He told her what they looked like, and when they were flowers, he told her how to plant them and watch them and feed them and water them. See here, he said suddenly, turning round to look at her. I'll plant them for thee myself. Where's the garden? Mary's thin hands clutched each other as they lay on her lap. She did not know what to say, so for a whole minute she said nothing. She had never thought of this. She felt miserable, and she felt as if she went red and then pale. Thus got a bit of garden, hasn't the? Dickon said. It was true that she had turned red and then pale. Dickon saw her do it, and as she still said nothing, he began to be puzzled. "'Wouldn't they give thee a bit?' he asked. "'Hasn't thou got any yet?' She held her hands tighter and turned her eyes toward him. "'I don't know anything about boys,' she said slowly. "'Could you keep a secret if I told you one? "'It's a great secret. I don't know what I should do if anyone found it out. "'I believe I should die.' She said the last sentence quite fiercely. Dickon looked more puzzled than ever, and even rubbed his hand over his rough head again, but he answered quite good-humouredly. "'I'm keeping secrets all the time,' he said. "'If I couldn't keep secrets from the other lads, secrets about foxes, cubs, and birds' nests, and wild things, holes, they'd be not safe on the moor. Aye, I can keep secrets.' Mistress Mary did not mean to put out her hand and clutch his sleeve, but she did it. I've stolen a garden, she said very fast. It isn't mine, is it isn't anybody's. Nobody wants it, nobody cares for it, nobody ever goes into it. Perhaps everything is dead in it already, I don't know. She began to feel hot and as contrary as she had ever felt in her life. I don't care, I don't care. Nobody has any right to take it from me when I care about it and they don't. They're letting it die all shut in by itself. She ended passionately, and she threw her arms over her face and burst out crying. Poor little Mistress Mary. Dickens' curious blue eyes grew rounder and rounder. Eh, he said, drawing his exclamation out slowly, and the way he did it meant both wonder and sympathy. I've nothing to do, said Mary. Nothing belongs to me. I found it myself, and I got into it myself. I was only just like the robin, and they wouldn't take it from the robin. "'Where is it?' asked Dickon in a dropped voice. Mistress Mary got up from the log at once. She knew she felt contrary again and obstinate, and she did not care at all. She was imperious and Indian, and at the same time hot and sorrowful. "'Come with me and I'll show you,' she said. She led him round the laurel path into the walk where the ivy grew so thickly. Dickon followed her with a queer, almost pitying look on his face. He felt as if he were being led to look at some strange bird's nest— and must move softly. When she stepped to the wall and lifted the hanging ivy, he started. There was a door, and Mary pushed it slowly open, and they passed in together. And then Mary stood and waved her hand round defiantly. It's this, she said. It's a secret garden, and I'm the only one in the world who wants it to be alive. Dickon looked round and round about it, and round and round again. Eh? he almost whispered. It is a queer, pretty place. It's like as if a body was in a dream. 
Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. If you enjoyed today's bite, please drop us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Also, be sure to check us on our website, www.biteatatimebooks.com, or all the social media, at Bite at a Time Books. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow while we take the next bite of The Secret Garden.